Mm -hmm. One thing that particles in Smash can do is form a resonance, and resonances can decay. Uh, then particles can scatter elastically or inelastically. There can be two to two scattering, or there can be two to n process. Two to two process is maintaining detailed balance. Two to n process is not maintaining maintaining detailed balance. Uh, resonance formation, it sounds like a simple thing. You just collide two pions and form a row, right? What can be complicated there? But the complicated part is that there are so many channels of resonance decays, and every channel is contributing to the total width. This plot is showing the width on mass dependence of the n star resonance. And then you can see all these little lines, green lines, red lines, um, blue lines, are all the contributing channels. So even for one resonance, the dependence of width on mass becomes a rather complicated function. And the only part where we know it experimentally is here at the pole. So experimentally, we only know pole mass, uh, pole mass and pole width. But all the rest of the function, uh, well, we just have a model of Mendeley and Zaleski, which, which is our ansatz. So, uh, I would like to also point out that if we have the pole mass and pole width uh, in the particle data group, it doesn't really mean we know everything about the resonance. There are also things like the width on mass dependence, which is the whole function that we may not know. And from, from this function, we construct a spectral function for the resonance. And then uh, according to the spectral function, resonance is decaying and resonance is formed. Here you can see uh, how you get the pi on pi on, this is pi plus pi minus total cross section. Uh, the red line is the total cross section from SMASH. The red dots are total cross sections uh, from experiment. They nicely coincide. The fact that they coincide is not really a result of some fit because the total cross section consists, consists of partial cross sections uh, of pi on pi on to omega, pi on pi on to rho, pi on pi on to sigma, pi on pi on to f2. And the only thing that we control is parameters of the resonances, omega, rho, sigma, f2. Uh, but we don't really control the total cross section explicitly. So it is really hard to tune transport codes because on the one hand, we have a lot of parameters and we can control uh, a lot of properties of the resonances. But on the other hand, uh, we are not controlling cross sections explicitly. Then for uh, two to two reactions, the, most of them are just nucleon, nucleon to nucleon, nucleon star, nucleon, nucleon to nucleon, delta star, nucleon, nucleon to delta, delta, uh, and excitations like this. Uh, if you have, for example, two resonances colliding, two lambdas colliding, uh, they will be mostly colliding uh, with relatively low cross-section and uh, the cross-section for nucleons will be taken for them with some specific factor and the whole model is called the additive quark model. Uh, so it is assumed that for resonances for which we don't know the cross-sections that they are in a way proportional to nuclear nuclear cross sections. There are also strangeness exchange reactions for producing lambdas, sigmas, and omegas. Uh, and there is a specific publication for strangeness exchange reactions. This is a completely separate topic. What I wanted to point out here is um, this proton proton cross sections. You can see that there is experimental cross section and there is. Smash cross section, they don't really coincide so exactly. But uh, the reason for that is that the proton proton cross section corresponds uh, to, to the sum of hundreds of little cross sections of proton proton to proton some resonance. And we do control parameters of each of these hundred little cross sections, but what we have in total is really sum of a lot of things. So it's really hard to mesh the cross section exactly here. Then there, are, there is string formation. And here I just refer to PTA because mostly this is happening via PTA8. We explicitly link PTA8 code to the smash. Uh, and then things like single or double diffractive scattering, baryon, anti baryon annihilation, non diffractive scattering, they're all happening via PTA. And string parameters are tuned to the recent data of an A61. 
uh, of proton proton uh, the data are really precise so many things we're just not able to tune precisely to, to the data uh, and you can see the details in this publication and with all this tuning uh, and with all these resonances and strings uh, here are some of some of the cross sections like proton pi on cross section what you can see in this proton pi on cross section what if you're not familiar with this cross sections especially really pay attention to the fact that there is a huge resonance peak on the left and it's relatively flat on the right so the, the left region is the resonance region here a lot of resonances are contributing to the cross section on the right there is just string model there are no resonances uh, and this cross section on the right here on the plot it ends at 5 GV but it's going flat like this until TV energies it's very slowly logarithmically growing then here it is split into more channels and you can see again that it is not so easy to tune these cross sections now for proton pi minus you have even more resonances in the left part you can see all these huge peaks they are resonances on the right side it's strings there are no resonances the cross section against energy is flat and this is very typical for all the particles in the left part you have for, for all the cross sections in the left part you have resonances and the right part you have the cross section which is very slowly logarithmically changing and again pi plus pi minus cross sections you can also see that there is resonant part here and on the right it is going to be relatively flat there from strings and again, proton-proton cross-section split into many channels. So I was mentioning that the total cross-section is sum of many, many things. And now you can see here what's happening with this many things. So there are a lot of small curves here in the right part adding up to make the right cross-section. Here I just have a semi-empty slide to analysis suite. We have something called smash analysis suite. Uh, I'm clicking on the link here, and I don't know if you see, do you see my screen right now? No, I think we still see your slides. So I think you would have to switch the window that you're sharing from the PDF to the browser if you're trying to share a link. Let me then stop sharing, yes, and share my whole screen. I, you may not have that option with all of the security settings on Zoom. So try to select the browser that you have it open in. Okay, so now I we see it. I open this link and you can see that there is a web page. It is completely open, shared with everybody, and it says analysis results. It means that the recent version of Smash 1.8 was run uh, in different setups uh, and a lot of different things were tested. So I was showing cross sections to you. Let's go to the cross sections, for example. And you can see that there are a lot of cross sections plots, much more than I have shown to you. And not all of these cross sections plots are really matching experimental data so beautifully. So uh, you can see all these dirty details right here. We are not hiding anything. Uh, and for most of the important cross sections, I think we are we are giving our results here. And it's pretty detailed. You can see how many cross sections I am listing right now. So if you are interested, what's really happening inside of Smash? Main thing is the cross sections. And here are the cross sections. Then one can go back and there is a thing like energy scan here, which means we just run smash for different energies and look at the results. Let's look, for example, at the mid rapidity yield. And here are some pi plus and pi minuses. Uh, if you just run smash at different energies and compare the number of pi pluses and pi minuses in heavy ion collisions, yeah, you roughly match the experimental data in proton proton you also roughly match the experimental data this is log plot so it's not completely perfect but you are roughly there for kaons well you don't really match them and for it's it's actually quite a typical problem for kaons for transport codes that's one of the reasons you need hydro but many transport codes like it's it's really hard to dig out this information what matches and what not and protons Protons are, are fine. Antiprotons are not so fine compared to experimental data. Protons are actually better than you think because some data are not corrected for weak decays. So if you look at this properly, the protons are actually matching very well. 
and lambdas are relatively fine. But then when you look at the size, like multi-strange particles, they are dramatically, dramatically off by like an order of magnitude. And in fact, the, the fact that you have strange particles, multi-strange particles, so much underestimated by transport codes is one of the arguments for the quark gluon plasma. Because if you put hydro in there and sample these particles from hydro, then you relatively match the data. From just pure transport code and hadronic reactions, you are not getting psi minus, and you are definitely not getting omega, like three orders of magnitude. And this kind of things you can look here in the analysis suite. So, okay, I'm, I'm using so much time that it's much more than I actually expected. So let me come closer to finish. Uh, how do I switch back? Let me see. Share screen. Okay, so I'm back to presentation. And this is the last slide of the presentation. I would like to ask first if you learned anything from the lecture. And no is a reasonable answer because either you might know everything or the lecture was too hard for you, you just didn't understand anything. Both things happen. So no is an okay thing to answer. You press yes and no. And after you press yes and no, if you pressed yes, then write one or two random things that you actually learned from the lecture in the chat. And for that, you have two minutes of waiting. And then Dima, um, while they do that, are you going to go through we are nominally seven minutes before the end of the session today. Um, were you going to do your interactive activities that you posted on today's agenda item today or tomorrow? I think I will just do a few preliminary things for interactive session. I, I will just make sure the prerequisites are there and ask the homework for tomorrow. Okay, so show them how to do things, but we don't wait for them to do it. Basically, yes. Basically, everything is going for tomorrow. Okay, great. We are seeing 39 yeses and a few things popping up in the chat on Slack. Mm -hmm. I don't see any no's and the yeses are ticking up. But again, don't be shy to put no because um, it's it's, it happens sometimes. I mean, sometimes you just join the lecture late and don't learn anything. Sometimes you just know everything and you didn't learn anything. Sometimes you just know so little that the lecture is not helpful. And it's anonymous, I guess. So you don't really know who puts yes, who puts no. It's not quite anonymous because not, there's, oh. there's uh, on the Zoom chat, we can see who clicked yes and who clicked no, what we, okay, but, but then there's a spelling. summary. Christian but I, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to save this information so it disappears after we close the Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. We're at 62 yeses and the number of responses had slowed, has slowed down a lot, so I would say move along. Okay, then let me stop sharing this.